this year we are embarking in a study of worship and what it means uh, to worship God and especially in the corporate or congregational sense what it means for us to worship and we've looked at a number of different things together but now we're kind of in this mode where we're looking at the actions or avenues of connection uh, that we partake in when we come together to worship and uh, we spend some time looking at prayer and now of course we find ourselves here talking about the Lord's Supper worship at the table and then of course the the subtitle these words from the famous Christian hymn when we meet in sweet communion now one of the things that a person even vaguely familiar with Christianity will understand is that the Lord's Supper is a central Christian practice it is a universally held practice no matter the disagreements over the fundamentals of Christianity this is practiced there may be some disagreements concerning how it is practiced and, and what it may mean every single time but it is certainly practiced by all who claim it now when it comes to the church and those of us who partake of the Lord's Supper every week you know, for many, they say they will not partake of the Lord's Supper every week because they say it gets old. And I think in some ways we have given credit to that because we have let it get old to us. It's not a, it's not a solid argument. It, I mean, it falls apart. You also preach every week. You also sing every week. You also pass a collection plate every week. Why is it the Lord's Supper that gets singled out? So it's, a, it's an argument that isn't really built on a solid foundation. But I have to wonder sometimes if there isn't a degree of just a little bit of angst to it that maybe we have treated it as common. You see, in my experience, people usually have a couple of different uh, views of the Lord's Supper. Some have a reverence for it, and reverence actually probably isn't the right word. It's, it's more like a magical thing. Like, as long as I took the Lord's Supper, I'm good, and I'm good forever. Like, um, as long as I took the Lord's Supper, it doesn't really matter if I hang around and worship or do anything else. That, that the Lord's Supper is some kind of a magic serum or bullet that makes me acceptable with God. And that's just an idea so completely foreign to the way the New Testament lays it out. Um, <clears throat> there are others who don't really see the importance at all. The Lord's Supper is just a time to, you know, eat some bread that tastes different and stale and kind of funny and not really sure why it's unleavened. Um, it's just something we kind of do and I don't really know why we do it but we do it and I usually scroll my phone or read the bulletin or do something while we're doing it the only problem with both of those views is that both of them are equally wrong this is why we're going through this because worship if we don't remind ourselves what it is we're doing and why it is we're doing it it becomes empty the reason why worship is not transformative for so many people is they don't even understand what they're doing they don't understand the ins and outs of it they don't understand why God has designed it this way and what they're supposed to be doing and why it is so Effective, and, and some people actually take this passive approach that says, if I partake of the Lord's Supper, like I expect this feeling to come on me. Listen, what we do in worship is not some kind of a magic thing that will produce a feeling on you. What we do in worship is a way of enhancing a feeling and a relationship that we have been building with God all throughout the week. And it is a way to come together with other people who've been doing the same thing and to pour ourselves out at the feet of the God of heaven. And the table is one of those elements. So what I want us to do this morning and tonight, however far we get this morning is however far, and then tonight we'll finish it, um, <clears throat> is first of all, when we're studying any subject, we want to look at all the passages under consideration, any passages that talk to us about the subject. And with the Lord's Supper, there are only a handful. Uh, you've got the, gospel, the synoptic Gospels. John does not mention it. Uh, so you've got the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then you've got a couple of places in Acts and a couple of places in 1 Corinthians. 
Um, and that's it. So we're going to look at those passages, and by look at them, I mean read them very quickly and move forward and put them in front of us. And then I want us to look at some descriptions that are given of the Lord's Supper um, <clears throat> in the New Testament and what they indicate to us. Then spend some time talking about the institution itself in Luke chapter 22. When Jesus institutes the supper, what is going on there? I mean, we read those words so many times, but those words are packed and, and full of the heart of Christianity right within those small words and those six verses in Luke's gospel. And then, <clears throat> definitely tonight, it won't be today, or this morning, we'll talk about the practice itself, what it is we're supposed to be doing, how we... Um, how the Lord's Supper helps us in our worship and why it's considered worship and why it enhances things for us as we, as we think together. So let's begin, first of all, by reading all of these passages. And I don't usually put verses on the screen, but for right now, it's the easiest way to go through this is to simply put them up there so we can see them quickly. This is Matthew's account. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. That's Matthew's account. You'll notice there are some slight differences in all of these. Um, and that's a whole different study on its own as to why there are some differences. Um, but we will use it and try it. Luke will be our main text, and then we'll try and bring in some others to help uh, kind of get a fuller picture. So then you have Mark's account, <clears throat> where he says, As they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now Luke's account, it was read for us at the Lord's Supper today and also in scripture reading, so I won't reread it, but I want you to pay attention. I hope you notice something in the two times we've already read it. There are two cups that are mentioned in this account. Okay? There are two cups. Notice in verse 16, For I tell you, I will not eat uh, it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take, eat, and divide it amongst yourselves. And then in verse 20, And likewise, the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup... This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. There are two cups in there. And we're going to talk about what's going on with that particular situation. Acts 2.42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and prayers. The breaking of bread uh, is the <clears throat> reference to the Lord's Supper, which we will explain a little more tonight. Acts 20 and verse 7, this is Paul in a missionary journey. He stays behind at a certain location for a week in order to partake of the Lord's Supper with them. And so on the first day of the week when they were we were gathered together, it's a manuscript. Some people will say when the disciples were gathered together to break bread. Again, a Lord's Supper reference, which we'll explain a little bit more. Paul <clears throat> talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Okay. Now, two other texts, one in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Or other translations will read communion. Uh, it's a Greek word, koinonia, in which we get the word fellowship. Um, that we, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread, and we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And then the last one is one that's very often cited, 1 Corinthians 11. But many times we focus on 23 to say 27, 28. I want us to see the full picture. It says, but in the following instructions I do not commend you because when you come together it is not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place when you come together as a church I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes, goes ahead with his own meal or goes hungry 
One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What do you not have houses to eat and to drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink, this, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats, and eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is what, why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. This is everything the New Testament says concerning the Lord's Supper. So now let's work through it a little bit and try and decipher the pro the, uh, and process all of the information. So let's begin with these descriptions. There are seven descriptions, seven words or phrases that describe the Lord's Supper. Probably the most popular, not in churches of Christ, but probably the most popular across the board and even with the early church was to describe the Lord's Supper as the Eucharist. Okay, as the Eucharist. For an example, this comes from a Greek term used in Luke's account. In Luke 22 and verse 19, it says, and he took bread and when he had given thanks, the Greek term there is eucharisto, eucharist. It just is the idea of giving thanks. And so the reason why so many people prefer this term to describe the Lord's Supper is because it describes what we should be thinking about as we partake of the Lord's Supper, giving thanks to God for what it is that he has done for us in Christ, or as Paul would describe it uh, in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15, thanks be unto God for his indescribable or unspeakable gift. And so it is referred to as Eucharist. The second <clears throat> is one that's probably the most common to us, and that is the Lord's Supper or the table of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 21. They both imply the same thing. Now, when he calls it the Lord's Supper, especially in the context of 1 Corinthians 11, he calls it the Lord's Supper because what they are doing, and <clears throat> first of all, one of the things we need to understand is that the Lord's Supper was not just a little bit of juice and a little bit of crackers. The Lord's Supper, as it was originally given, was actually a full-fledged meal that was eaten in the local church. That's the way the Lord's Supper was. It wasn't until the 4th century that we started using smaller portions in the Lord's Supper. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying if you don't understand that it was a full-fledged meal, it's, we're going to have a hard time understanding what the New Testament actually says about the Lord's Supper. And some of these images are not going to make a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> and so when he calls it the Lord's Supper... In that context, what he's doing is contrasting the Lord's Supper and the, what they were doing was intermingling their meals with the Lord's Supper and not discerning. There's a difference between a meal you eat at home and something else and the Lord's Supper that honors the Lord himself. And uh, we'll dive more deeply into that tonight as we look in 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> but it's called the Lord's Supper because of that very reason. It's his. It belongs to him. It's in honor of him. And we do it because of him. Okay? Number three, it's also referred to many times as, as I think this is out of order, Ms. Debbie. I checked this. We don't, we're not exactly sure why these things are getting out of order, but uh, they are. Yeah, there we go. Next, it is referred to as communion, 1 Corinthians 10, where it says the participation in the body of Christ or the communion of the body of Christ, depending upon your translation. As we said, the term is koinonia. It's the term translated fellowship. So why is it called communion? Because in the supper, you're communing with God. You're communing with Jesus. This is why he says, I'm not going to eat this bread and drink this cup until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now there are two opinions about that. One believes that that's future, that will happen way at the end of time. I, 
I mean, I respect that. I just don't think that's what that's about. I think that's about right now. The kingdom of God began, has already begun. And so when we partake in the supper, we're communing, number one, according to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, the cup, the, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? We're communing with Christ and contemplating his sacrifice with him. And thus we call it communion. Now the only way you can do that, you can't just take the cup and drink it and take the bread and pop it in and sit there and go, I'm waiting for the feeling. It doesn't work that way. You've got to see him that you're communing with him. You've got to put yourself in the upper room where Jesus is as he institutes the supper and as he distributes these goods to you to eat and drink to remind you of what this is about. It's taking time to commune with Jesus around a table. Now, the reason why this one is especially hard is because as Americans, we are extremely time conscious. And we don't want the Lord's Supper to last more than many times two minutes. I'm not sure how much you can commune in 120 seconds. But it's not just communion with God, it's also communion with one another. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 17, he goes on to say, we are all one body and we partake of the one bread. We're not just communing with Jesus, we're communing actually also with one another in the process. As the 12 disciples, or the, as the disciples sat around the table with him and communed over the meal, us, how, how many, however many of us there are in this room, when we come together around that table and we partake of this, all of us are communing together with Jesus and communing with one another. And that means, and we'll talk more about this tonight, that means that our relationship with one another has to be what it's supposed to be. It has to be. And so it's referred to as communion, where you focus on the present. Number two, it's referred to, or whatever this is, I think this is four probably. It's referred to as a memorial. Jesus said in Luke 22 and verse 19, As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And Paul, of course, will place emphasis on it in 1 Corinthians 11 as well. And so what we're doing is, as a memorial, what are you doing? You're reenacting, you're reminding yourself of the Lord's Supper. It's based upon a memorial whether it's a memorial that you act out or a memorial like a monument that is placed somewhere, what is it doing? It's put there so that people not forget, that they be reminded of an event that took place in the past that was so important and fundamental that now we remember it all these days and years later. So the Lord's Supper is a memorial in the sense that we're looking back to an event in history in the past. Okay? And that event in history was when Jesus was crucified. We're not looking back. Listen, Christianity is not a religion based in pie in the sky stuff. Well, we're just kind of reflecting, you know, the time when Jesus died and we're all floating on clouds together. No. We are going back to the early parts of the first century outside of the city of Jerusalem to watch Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, be crucified. An actual historical event. Not a nice little story somewhere that we read in a book. An actual historical event as real as the invasion in Normandy in World War II. It is as real as that moment. And we are remembering what he endured. Now, to remember what he endured, I think there are a lot of things that also have to be understood. And this is why, with so many other things in worship, people say, I don't get certain things out of it. Well, with pretty much anything, it depends on what you put into it. Have you ever spent any time studying what crucifixion was like? to the physical frame alone because when you do and then you come into and you take the memorial and you think back to the moment and you think of the excruciating pain he went through becomes a different ball game 
So we're remembering what it is that Jesus has done in the past. But also, it's about anticipation. Paul says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. It's looking in the future. We're looking back to the first coming of Jesus and his incarnation when he came to earth and looking forward to the time when Jesus will return. Now, I want you to take these three, communion, memorial, and anticipation. Communion is present. You're communing with Jesus presently in that moment. The memorial, you're looking back into the past. And with the anticipation, you're looking forward to the future. Let me see if I can make this a little bit more applicable for people today. Let's take systems of government for a minute. Some people are traditionalists. They want to go back to a way that certain things were. Okay, Whatever government system that they, and how they thought it operated the best, they want to go back to then, that, that tradition. If we can just go back to that, everything's going to be all right. Other people say, no, we've got to create. And so basically they idealize the past and say, that's when everything was like it should be. Other people with a socialistic, communistic, utopian idea. And by the way, I'm not commenting and making an endorsement of any of these things. I'm telling you how this relates. Okay? Socialists and communists, what are they trying to do? They're trying to create a system of equality straight across the board where everyone is equal and there are no differences between people and everyone treats one another with justice and fairness. That's the goal they're reaching for. And they're trying to create it now. And then you've got other people in democracy who are always chasing something in the future. If we're just exceptional enough, we can rise to a level where some of these things will never exist anymore. We won't have these problems anymore. Do you notice how each of them are doing something different? They're asking you to pick the past. They're asking you to pick the present. Or they're asking you to pick the future. Jesus is saying, leave all three behind. And in the present, commune with me by looking at the past and anticipating the future that I'm bringing to you. Jesus infuses meaning into every portion of time. The Lord's Supper infuses meaning. It's not saying you have to pick the past and forget the present and be doom in the future. It doesn't say you have to curse the past and you know, curse the future and be, and be joyful in the present. Or you know, just wait to the future and then curse everything in the present and the past. It says you can love and honor and enjoy past, present, and future in Jesus. And there's nothing else in our world. There's no other philosophical point or or framework that will give you that type of fulfillment. Not one. Then number, well, I guess I need to back up because we are out of order, right? Yep, okay. It's also a covenant meal. A covenant meal. Luke 22 and verse 20. This is the cup which is for you is the new covenant in my blood or New Testament. Those are just words. They're synonymous with one another. Um, And so this new covenant meal, it brought about a covenant. So when people would make a covenant or a contract with one another, it was a little bit different than us. Um, First of all, because they didn't have a lot of paper and other things along those lines. Um, And so... when they would make a meal, when, or when they would make a covenant, literally, it should be translated cut a covenant. Especially in the Old Testament, the majority of the time you see the word covenant, it should be translated. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew text says it. It's just not translated that way. That you're supposed to cut the covenant. And that's because, it's Genesis 15, uh, is where you see an image of it. <clears throat> you would take an animal and you would cut it in half and divide it. You'd lay one half on this side and one half on this side. And so it's a very bloody experience. 
And the two people that were making the covenant would walk through it together. And what they were saying is, if I fail to keep up my side of the covenant, may I become like this animal. And so covenants were dedicated with blood. And then they were closed when the two sat down and shared a meal together. Jesus is bringing those images together at the supper. Right? This is my blood of the covenant, the new covenant. And this is the meal that seals it. So it's a covenant meal. You see it take place in Exodus 24. Uh, it's referenced in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 11 and some other places. But it also, by the way, says something about your loyalty and my loyalty. In 1 Corinthians 10, 21, which we'll deal with more tonight, <clears throat> when he says you cannot partake of the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils or the demons, you cannot eat at the table of the Lord and the table of demons, talking about idolatry, that cup also represents your allegiance. Because when you swear yourself to someone with a covenant, you have allegiance toward that. So when we partake of the cup, when we drink, we're telling people, we're proclaiming our allegiance to Jesus and to no one else. And then finally, it's about sacrifice. Jesus said, this is my body. Or my blood, which or my body, which is given for you, my blood, which is poured out for you. When was this supper? When was the Lord's supper instituted? Passover, which is when they sacrificed the lamb, so that God would literally pass over them with judgment and the death of the firstborn in Exodus 12. This was about a sacrifice. Paul is already going to say in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 that Jesus is that sacrifice. He's our Passover. He's the one who's been sacrificed for us. And this is the language of atonement where blood is being used and cast. And so Jesus, <clears throat> this is about remembering sacrifice, voluntary sacrifice, walking into and helping people be reconciled back to God. Now, we haven't even gotten started. Those are just descriptions. Just by looking at the names that are given to it. Don't you think then that it's a little bit more than peel, pop, peel, drink? Maybe it's a little bit more, take me to the upper room and Jesus remind me. Remind me of what you've done. Give me my opportunity to thank you for what you've done. Forgive me for not honoring this sacrifice every day of my life. It's transformative. Something so little can become something so richer where we peel and pop and peel and drink. It's common. You could, I'm pretty sure a manufacturer probably makes some other stuff kind of like this. You can pop and peel and do all that kind of stuff. When you put the right elements in and you put the right heart and you meet with the Lord over it, this facilitates tremendous spiritual growth if we take it seriously for what it is. I'm going to stop there. We're not even going to get into institution because we don't have the time to dive into it right now. But as we worship, 
as we partake in the Lord's Supper. Let's remember that worship itself is a transformative experience to the degree that we actually understand what's going on. And to the degree that we have a relationship with the God to whom we offer worship. The majority of complaints I've heard my entire life about worship is that it's too long and it's too boring. I'm here to tell you my number one complaint is that it is too short. It is too short. And it is not thoughtful enough. Because when you start understanding these elements, this is just the Lord's Supper, and we're just at the names. I'm starting to realize now that I could only get this far, that this may be tonight, this may be tonight and the next Sunday morning. And even then, I've already cut out mountains of stuff. Maybe if, you know, we talk a lot about returning to the biblical pattern for worship. Listen, returning to the biblical pattern of worship is far more than just doing the right things. It's about knowing what they mean and why we're doing them. And it's about engaging the whole, the totality of our being in those moments. They're avenues by which our souls connect to God and that energy infuses into us. That transformation is infused into us. And as I've thought about it, one of the, the thing that probably scares me a lot about this is how many times have I been to church and didn't worship? And how many people have gone their whole life and they've experienced, they've come to church, but they've never really experienced worship? Not even yet. They think we're just singing to walls and eating some funny crackers. We're connecting to the living God. And you are never more alive than when you're there. The supper is one of those central elements. And it reminds us of what Jesus has done for us. That when I hold that unleavened bread in my hand, why is it unleavened? We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But why is it unleavened? Just because we like unleavened bread? It was at the Passover. You can't have leaven. But leaven is also in Scripture associated with sin. It's a very negative connotation. There's a, a, one positive connotation, but the rest are negative. So when I'm holding unleavened bread, which represents the unleavened body of Jesus, it represents the sinless body of Jesus. He is sinless, and he had to be because I couldn't. See how the gospel starts now? I'm holding unleavened bread because I couldn't be perfect, because I'm a sinner what Keith talked about Wednesday night, a body God prepared for him so that he could give his life and that his blood could set me free and pay the ransom for my sin and bring me into covenant with God. That's the gospel. And this morning if somebody wants to enter into that, Jesus is ready and he is willing and we are happy to help with a penitent faith that confesses Jesus to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Enter into that sweet communion with him.
or maybe as a New Testament Christian, we haven't been who we're supposed to be. Maybe that's something we want to talk about publicly or privately or just pray together about it, whatever it is. Or maybe we're just struggling in general. Jesus is there to meet us. If we can help you this morning, we want to as we stand and sing this song.